By the end of this video, you're gonna learn a strategy that I use to avoid getting stuck in any ecosystem. This strategy that I'm talking about is made out of three very simple steps. One, breaking bridges. Two, building bridges. And three, being agnostic. I'm Alex and I do down to earth tech videos. I should preface this entire video with there are no shortcuts. Now don't expect an easy kind of get out of jail card here. I'll give you some context and go through the strategy that did help me, but there's no magic one to you know just kind of make it happen. Recently, I came to the realization that it's extremely hard to mix Android devices in a predominantly Apple ecosystem and vice versa. It was quite tricky bringing the iPhone 15 Pro Max, for example, into my tech life which has recently been centered around Android devices. The first step of the strategy is destroying bridges. I know, sounds a bit dramatic, right? But it's on purpose. I don't want you to underestimate this. As the title suggests, you're gonna have to be quite ruthless and be prepared to let go of some things and deal with some compromises and trade-offs, but all with the goal to, you know, get something that works for you. One of the challenges that you're gonna have regardless of the way you're going, is photos and videos. One of the biggest questions I get, to be fair, usually from Apple users, from iPhone users, goes a little bit like this. Okay, Alex, I'd love to try one of these new devices that you're showing here, but realistically, how do I move my photos and videos to Android? Let's start with family photos and stuff that you wanna remember for a long time, right? These will be photos and videos that you really care about and you access them quite frequently. For that, the recommendation is Google Photos. You know, it will indeed retain those live photos aspects as well. So if you decide later to go back to Android or back to Apple, those photos won't lose the fact that they were live photos. You know, at least that is a universal thing, which is great, which is not the case for a lot of the things we're gonna discuss here. The second option is for work-related projects. You know, these are projects that you may use them for about a year, but then never need it again after two, three years. When I say projects, by the way, I really just mean a bunch of videos, photos, and documents, right? And to do that, I use external storage. So I've got lots of M.2 SSDs into hubs, like, like this one here from Acasis, for about a year whilst I still use them. And for stuff that I wanna keep just for backup purposes, this would just leave in a cheaper hard drive after a year. I do have some recommendations for that too, which I've been using for nearly three years now, and I'll leave all those links down below for you. In summary on this one, you want to, as much as possible, right, stay away from putting all your eggs in one basket. And you wanna decouple yourself from services that may lock you in in future. Sure, there are benefits of having everything with one single provider, but you could find yourself stuck or facing expensive monthly charges. For me, Google Photos is one basket, right? But it provides a nice balance between flexibility and cost as well. Because once I moved everything out of iCloud into Google Photos, it kind of enabled me to move between any devices and you know, kind of go back to Apple if I want to in future without having to worry about my photos. You know, they will always end up in the same place. It doesn't have to be Apple's ecosystem, by the way. Good morning. This will be true for Android as well, especially if you're feeling like trying a new device, for example, that doesn't gel with your current wow. ecosystem. With music, I think the problem is largely resolved already with services like Spotify, Amazon Prime, right? YouTube Music, and really, it's gonna come down to the service that you like the most. If you're a serious music lover though, and you want the, you know, your lossless audio, I'm sure you already have your Tidal, your Deezers. I won't dwell too much on music because those days are gone, right? When we had large iTunes libraries and lots of MP3 files, you know, all those things lying around on our phones and our hard drives. In other words, in those scenarios, you are already kind of destroying those bridges anyway. Other bridges that you can destroy is your email system. And I should follow that advice myself. Just, just look at those emails, right? But your passwords as well. I was actually guilty myself of saving way too many passwords on my browser. And if you're doing that on Safari, for example, you may be inclined to just stay with Apple just because of that alone. Not to mention, it's pretty poor practice, right? Which brings me to today's sponsors, NordPass. I'm sure like me, you've got many devices and probably a mixed ecosystem as well with dozens of usernames and passwords, right? Stored in browsers, different tablets, and all sorts of different devices too. I work in the tech industry and I'm constantly reminded pretty much on a daily basis of the dangers of the internet. These cybersecurity risks, you know, they don't take a break. The bad guys, and a lot of them are just bots, are constantly trying to hack into our systems. All it takes is one account to be compromised, right, for it to be a massive problem. NordPass does all the groundwork for us, scanning the web for data leaks and alerting us if our accounts have been compromised. And what I love about NordPass is how easy they make this for us, you know? Over here on the app itself, you can clearly see where you have potentially compromised passwords. It's so good to be reminded where a password may be too old, not complex enough, or perhaps already used too many times. 
And here's the thing, it doesn't matter how careful I am with my passwords, I can't personally protect my family accounts as well. I have a young child who's starting to have emails now and access online accounts, school systems, and having something within the same subscription for me that protects his accounts and my wife's accounts as well is just great. And having something like NordPass that helps me automatically sync across all my devices is just awesome. I can store all my passwords in one safe place and given how many times I use this to access different accounts on a daily basis, right? It's just great not having to remember any of my passwords anymore. I really encourage you to take a look at their offerings because I was surprised myself at how much they offer now. So many features now for the price, fantastic value. Just head over to nordpass.com forward slash Alex Gear and Tech to get access to Nordpass best offer right now. And the best thing for you is that there's no risk. There's a 30 day money back guarantee. And if you're watching this from a TV right now, just pause this video and scan the QR code here. And thanks so much Nordpass for sponsoring this video and making this video possible. True story, a good friend of mine last week had a huge scare and nearly got scammed. He caught it early and one of the things that actually helped him was having a good handle on his passwords and multi-factor authentication. So yeah, always good to stay vigilant and a password manager like NordPass is really helpful too. Okay, so we destroyed bridges, we protected ourselves. Next step is to start building bridges. And the first one that I wanted to tackle in this section is messaging. Yes, the good old blue bubbles versus green bubbles, which is predominantly an American issue, right? My American friends over there, it's your fault. In all seriousness though, the iPhone is the only device that has a different default messaging app to everybody else, of course. Since around 2011, iMessage became super popular, has lots of cool features now, has encryption, can work on your computer and your tablets, but as we know, it won't work on Android. Actually, just a quick aside on iMessage encryption, by the way, I couldn't find a recent source for this, but as of two years ago, if you have iCloud backup, basically Apple has the encryption key. So technically, if this is too true, they could read your messages. But I need to find out more about this, do a bit more research. And if you have more up-to-date information on this one, do let me know so I can link it in this video. From an experience perspective, Apple will make you look really bad, right? With those green bubbles, if you're an Android user in a group message with lots of iPhone users. Yeah, the experience is gonna suck for you. But I wanna throw a question to you really, and a bit of a challenge as well, mostly to the youngsters out there and my viewers in America. Do you think that iMessage should work on Android phones? Let me know. The other thing that I was kinda of hoping would happen is for legislation to get involved, right, and help us here. As much as I don't agree with everything that the European Union do, they did get us USB-C on the iPhone. But Apple is not the only one playing this silly game, right? Google has RCS and that has the potential to be even more popular in terms of how many users globally use it. In theory, I found some web results. I can show them if you ask. Be quiet. In theory, uh -huh. dude, shut up. Hmm? No. In theory, Apple could support RCS right in the future, even if it doesn't have all the bells and whistles. Because it's RCS, it would still support some of the useful stuff that we care about, like message encryption and read receipts, for example. Whilst we wait for that nirvana, we can start using more messaging apps. And this is the part of this strategy where building bridges between ecosystems comes in. Outside of America, WhatsApp and Telegram are really, really popular. I mean, it's growing all the time. Over here in the UK, I personally have maybe 10% of my messages coming through the default app, like iMessage or even Messages on Android. It's really rare to use them. I use WhatsApp and Telegram way more than those messaging apps. And I'm probably not even the best example of them. There are lots of people I know that only use those apps. My school parents groups, WhatsApp, YouTube creators group, Telegram and WhatsApp, my consulting business group chat, WhatsApp, and all the contacts within those groups, they don't text me via iMessage or messages. Most of them, 99% I would say, is via WhatsApp or Telegram. Okay, so for messaging we can get around it, but what about FaceTime? I'm sure you probably knew this already, right? But Apple has introduced this ability to send an Android user a link to join you via FaceTime. So if you were thinking about getting an Android phone and FaceTime itself was a blocker for you, maybe this will help you change your mind a little bit. But I gotta be honest, it's still a workaround, right? It's not really a, a nice solution. It's better than nothing but it's just like receiving a Zoom invite. Now we talked about sharing things between friends and family and communicating between them, but what about sharing things between your devices? In my last video about this, about a year ago, I said that there was nothing that came close to AirDrop. That has changed. I've been using something called Neodrop recently, and it's a bit of an obscure little app, you know, it's not really on the App Store, but basically lets an Android device see a MacBook or the iPhone as if it was any other Android nearby share device. It's awesome and just as fast as nearby share or AirDrop. 
I mean, there's a couple of extra clicks that you've got to do, but you know, whereas AirDrop and Nearby Share just sends it. With Neardrop, you have to accept the transfer in the notification tray. Not a major deal, but if you rely a lot on AirDrop or Nearby Share, Quick Share, several times a day, I still think using them natively is still gonna be better. But I've been really happy with Neardrop because like I said, it's only two extra clicks really to get what I want and that's reasonable to me. But let me level with you. Having to do this at all is really annoying actually, right? Let's have a bit of a rant here, or an intellectual discussion. Right? Wouldn't it be awesome to have a universal standard for wireless transfers? I'm probably dreaming here, but hear me out. I'm not saying companies should not have an ecosystem, but I think for essential activities like messaging and transferring things between our own devices at home should be universal. We as consumers should be able to buy a device that we want that suits us best and that should be able to work with other devices regardless of the brands. Why can't you have an iPhone and a Windows machine and be able to easily send files between them? Equally, you know, why can't you have a MacBook and an Android phone without having to go through third-party apps like Neardrop, you know, to get things transferred? That would really help us creating an even stronger bridge between those ecosystems, but I can dream, right? Okay, so we destroyed bridges, we built some bridges, and now before we start talking about the third strategy, which is being agnostic, there is one thing which I'm pretty sure is at the back of your mind as well, which is the music and call handoff between devices. You may hear this from both Android and Apple users on how nice the ecosystem works for them and on how handing things off between devices like music and phone calls works perfectly. An example that's close to me is the handoff between the iPhone and the HomePod or AirPods and MacBook or iPad. This really isn't as smooth as people portray it, you know, it is really not intelligent either. It feels quite random, especially if you're working on a Mac and you're trying to use the iPhone or an iPad at the same time as listening to music, yet yeah, you will randomly start picking up the audio on the iPad and then start playing through the headphones. All of a sudden, you know, if, if you kind of move things around, the MacBook speakers start going and you're like, I was working on it. It still drives me nuts. It's just so random what it does. It doesn't matter what I press on the MacBook Pro, if I'm watching something on the iPad or on the iPhone, the, the sound just gets really messed up. The only way around for me sometimes is to turn off Bluetooth on the iPad I mean, what sort of experience is that, right? It's just nuts. And that's true for AirDrop as well. I have to relaunch Finder, you know, to get AirDrop to function sometimes or turn off Bluetooth and back on. It's just not very consistent, but let me know, maybe it's, maybe it's just me. By the way, before I forget, a thumbs up will go a long way. It really helps YouTube recommend this channel to other people. But the absolute best way to support this channel and support me really, is to share this video with someone who likes tech gadgets, you know, with your WhatsApp group or whatever. And if it's your first time here and you like my stuff, it would be awesome if you subscribed as well. In return, I'll be here at least once a week with a new down to earth tech video for you. Now, this next part of the strategy is where we start being agnostic. And this one is very close to my heart and my own experience, which brings me to this smartwatch problem. Soon to be true as well for the Vision Pro and things like that, make no mistake, Vision Pro is gonna be one of the biggest ecosystem lock-ins as well, right? But we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. If you've been following the channel, you know that for several months, I really struggled with wanting to keep my Apple Watch Ultra, where is that? It's collecting dust here at the moment, but I also wanted to enjoy Android devices at the same time. My initial solution was to get a burner iPhone. I got the 13 mini. Well, let me rephrase that. I could have gotten a burner iPhone, but I ended up overspending and getting the 13 mini. Let's ignore that for a moment because the fact still remains, right? The, the sole purpose of the 13 mini was to sync up my Apple Watch Ultra and sort of keep my Apple ecosystem going, which it did do really well. But if I'm true to myself, I know that I could have achieved that with an iPhone 11 or even older. So clearly not the cheapest solution, but it was entirely possible. You know, if you really want to wear an Apple Watch and keep your Android phone, a burner iPhone is not out of the question. I don't think it should be ignored. Another solution is to use another Apple device that you may already have, like a Mac mini or a MacBook Pro or something like that, and use that as a relay messaging server for your notifications and stuff. I'll link you up to a video about that, but the iPhone burner solution for me was the best sort of cost benefit. Now, if you don't wanna have a burner, then the solution really is to look elsewhere. This is where we really could be agnostic, right? And it's actually what I ended up doing in the end and still doing today. And hey, this is not a like-for-like -like replacement, but I will share my experience here and hope that helps you. I loved the Apple Watch Ultra. I really think it was one of the best Apple products released in, in recent years, really. But for me, for my personal use, the benefits I was getting on the Android phones just outweighed the benefits of keeping an iPhone just for the sake of syncing with the Apple Watch, which is where the Garmin came in. It's not a smartwatch. It has some smartwatch features really, like notifications and hooking it up to your AirPods and playing music, but there's no cellular. That's not where the strengths are. This for me is ticking two major boxes, right? One which is around fitness tracking and the other is sleep tracking. And once I figured that out, that I was getting the two things that I care about the most, 
with the Garmin, it was a no-brainer. Plus, it's actually a third thing which I only realized later. With the Garmin, I have battery for several days. Anything more than four or five days is a bonus for me, and you're getting six days with the Epic so far. But that's amazing, right? In comparison with the Apple Watch Ultra, which for me anyway is only lasting like two days. Yeah, that's an amazing improvement. And I totally appreciate that some people are okay with that. And the other thing that might stop you doing this is your data, right? Like me, you might be concerned about losing your fitness data that you already have on the Apple Watch. And a really cool way that I found to build a bridge, right, was through using an aggregator. An aggregator basically collects your fitness data regardless of the watch that you're wearing in an agnostic way. I'll leave a link down below for you. I'm not sponsored by them. It's just a great service that, again, allows me to be free from any lock-ins and I can use whatever smartwatch I like. If I fancy using the Apple Watch Ultra on the weekends and the Garmin during the week, with the service, I can have a single source of truth for my fitness data. Bosh. I'm kind of fed up with this angle. Let's go sit down over here. That's better. With all of that said, and let's assume that you follow this strategy to a T, or maybe not exactly, but you adapt it to your own style, you might still end up with a big question mark, which is, Alex, I don't care about any of this stuff. You know, when it comes to my main devices, I care about the cameras, I care about the display and the battery life. Well, I've got good news for you. The reality of displays, cameras and batteries in any of these flagship devices that I review here, and I even include the latest, you know, the Pixel 8 Pro in here as well, and the foldables too, right, the Fold 5. The reality is that they are all very close when it comes to how they perform in camera, battery and display. So if those things are really important to you, I'd say they're much less of a showstopper now than they used to be. In other words, I think you'd be safe with any flagship device these days. Now there is one differentiator which, at the moment, it's not gonna suit your setup if it's centered around the iPhone. And that one thing is multitasking. I won't cover that here as I talked to death about this in my recent reviews, but if you're someone who really cares about getting work done on your smartphone and you wanna have multi-window and be able to use stylus natively, then of course your options are going to be limited towards Android devices. But to recap then, first, destroy the bridges, be mindful of the services that you lock yourself in, right? Break away from them as much as possible. Using Google Photos is a good example of, you know, not locking into Apple or Samsung services. That's going to be a great first step, even though that in itself is moving a lot of your eggs into Google, right? It's a single basket. But it's the most flexible, I think, because you can take that with you regardless of the device that you go with in future. Use an external storage as well to back up large files and media, you know, before uploading them to Google Photos and being very strict on, you know, what you back up to the cloud. Because if you notice, that's where everyone's going. Everyone wants you to sign up to a cloud service. Then do things to build bridges between ecosystems, you know, create the connection between Android and Apple. Consider using a burner iPhone if you have to, right? If you want to use an Apple Watch with an Android phone and be agnostic. Consider using things from brands that will work with any ecosystem. Garmin is a good example. Smart Rings is another. Amazon might be an example in future. And hey, ultimately, there's plenty I wish could be better today and I'm constantly learning so if you found better ways to stay away from an ecosystem lock-in let me know what you do so i can include that in my next videos when it comes to the challenges of switching ecosystem i shared loads in this playlist over here and youtube thinks you're gonna like this video over here too hope to see you there bye